Hello, it's Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada. I'm shooting from the Lugnuts facility, and uh, what we have here is a 2021 Audi RS6 Avant. So it is a pretty special car, um, very limited, uh, limited production volumes, uh, and um, huge performance. So we'll do a narrated walk-around video uh, I'll, I'll start with a short section of, about, the, about the Audi Sport, about the RS, about this car, um, and then we'll go through the bill of sale and uh, the options that the car has. We'll do a walk around video, um, a paint meter report, uh, we'll have a look at the car underneath, and uh, we'll finish it up with um, a driving video. So, uh, as is, uh, my custom will be uh, very thorough. Uh, we'll break the video uh, into sections, so if you just want to skip ahead to the paint meter report or the driving video, uh, you can do that. So look, look at the uh, table of contents. Um, but the uh, overall, the synopsis of the car is it's, uh, is it's a one-owner car uh, bought in Toronto, but, um, but it lives, uh, it's lived in, in BC. Uh, it's got a clean Carfax with no accident uh, history. And it's just been to the dealer, and all of its services and uh, recalls are uh, freshly up to date. Um, so this is uh, one of only about like, six or seven Audi Sport um, designed and built cars, Audi Sport being a subsidiary of Audi. What I think is interesting about Audi Sport is the origin of that, which started on the Porsche 959 assembly line. So in the late 80s, Porsche built the 959, they did their limited run, and then they had excess capacity, and they were looking for other kind of consulting jobs to, uh, to you know, make that line active and to get some more revenue. They made a deal with first with Mercedes for the 500E, and as, and as most enthusiasts know, um, that uh, body shell was shipped from Mercedes and built uh, with Porsche. The next car they did was the Audi RS2, uh, which had a lot of Porsche 993 components. They did that in the mid 90s. So that started the, you know, the, um, the performance uh, division of Audi, called Audi Sport, similar to what AMG uh, is to Mercedes and Alpina to uh, BMW. The difference is, I think that they've done a lot fewer Audi Sport cars, RS cars, than they've done AMGs. They make an AMG, I'm sure there's an AMG Sprinter van, they do an AMG of everything. Um, but for the Audi Sport, I think they only did seven or eight cars, um, starting with the RS2s, and they haven't sold them in North America every year. So these are more than just a trim package, more than just uh, graphics or whatever. You know, they are, the whole powertrain and so on is re-engineered, you know, uh, with a separate subsidiary company. Okay, so the RS7 is called a Sportback, and the RS6 is available as a, what we call a, a wagon, which Audi calls an Avant, and they're mechanically identical. And they have a uh, twin turbo um, V8 engine, hot V, so the exhaust, uh, the exhaust uh, outlet is in the center of the V where the turbochargers are and that gives the shortest path to spool up the turbos and the shortest distance to the catalytic converters for emissions. So that's kind of the new, you know, the new family of V8 engines and that would be very similar but not exactly the same as the four liter twin turbo engine that's in the Bentley Continental and the Lamborghini Urus uh, as well as the Porsche Panamera all those, all that four liter twin turbo hot V engines are shared within the kind of upper echelon of the VW Audi group, okay? Which is also Bentley and Lamborghini. Now, going forward, what will most likely happen is there'll be one platform and one engine and one transmission and a Lamborghini, Bentley, Porsche, and Audi version of that platform. But, but in this version, and, and this Audi came out in 2019, I believe, um, we have different variations. So the, uh, the Porsche would have the engine behind the front axle line with a PDK gearbox. This installation would be very similar to what's in a, a V8 Bentley Continental. 
um, uh, very, very, very close in fact. And the advantage that this gives is when you can take the engine and push it ahead of the front axle, the packaging is a little bit more compact and you give a little bit more passenger room for the exterior footprint. Um, you give up a little bit in, in racetrack dynamics. You know, the Porsche, for instance, has the engine behind the front axle, um, but I've never seen a station wagon at a racetrack yet. Okay, so, so for, for what most people need a vehicle to do, um, this is, I think, a, a, better, uh, a better arrangement. And it also puts a little bit more weight, you know, a few percentage points, over the front axle, which aids in uh, wet weather and snow traction, which is something that, at least in Calgary, you know, you are uh, going to use. Okay, so we've got the twin turbo, four liter V8, about 590 horsepower, about the same in torque, going through uh, an eight speed uh, automatic gearbox. Um, this goes back to the rear, and this car has um, the dynamic package, uh, which gives you uh, a um, torque vectoring rear differential, okay, and rear wheel steering, and uh, standard on the RS6 is adaptive air suspension, okay, so we don't have coil springs, uh, we've got the air bladders which the car rests on, and this gives you a little bit more um, scope for the ride um, handling balance, so it can be a little bit more comfortable and a little bit stiffer than uh, a coil spring setup, which is, um, which is uh, a little bit more focused, okay? So it can be, the, the takeaway on that is it can be a little bit more comfortable, okay? There's different settings, of course. Uh, the RS settings on the steering wheel uh, influence the, you know, everything from the throttle mapping to the suspension to the exhaust, et cetera. But with an air suspension car, there's the ability to be more comfortable. Also, the ride height can change. So at highway speeds and at loading, it can be a little bit lower, but if you need to clear an obstacle, it can be a little bit higher. So that's state of the art, I would say, in $100,000, $150,000 uh, high-end German vehicles, you know, five or 600 horsepower, all-wheel drive, air suspension, rear wheel steering, and you know, this Audi, Audi has uh, all of those. Um, for brakes, um, we have absolutely enormous uh, steel brakes on this car with, uh, if we can get a shot on that. Now those are two piece rotors. So we've got the aluminum um, hub or hat, and then there is some air space between that and the steel rotor, and that's to dissipate uh, heat, and we have you know, some of the largest brake calipers I've ever seen on a car. Uh, those are 10 piston calipers, and we have, you know, 17 point something inch uh, front rotors on the car, and they are radi radially and axially vented. Cool. So this is probably the setup you want for an all-weather uh, all wagon uh, with, uh, you know, 22 inch rims and snow tires, steel rotors, and uh, Torsen-based uh, four-wheel drive system, and a torque vectoring rear differential and air suspension. So let's go through the, the bill of sale and the options on this car. Um, this is a 2021 and the MSRP was 120,000. I noticed that on a 2024, the MSRP I think is 147. So the car has gone up $25,000 uh, since it was bought in uh, 2021. We have the dynamic package, and what this gives you is the um, torque vectoring, rear differential, rear wheel steering, and the active, uh, active steering for the front wheels which would then be variable assist and feel uh, uh, for the steering, changing dependent on what uh, RS program you're in uh, and speed that you're driven, et cetera. Um, we've got the 22-inch RS design titanium wheel package, 
We have the driver assistance package, the painted steel brake calipers in red, uh, the Bang & Olufsen uh, advanced 3D sound system at $5,500. Uh, we have extra leather on the dash armrests. Uh, we have the rear side airbags and the infrared camera was $2,500. So all in all in uh, 2021, before freight and PDI and dealer ads and so on, uh, this car was $136,550. And now it would be from what I can gather on the Audi website, an extra $25,000. Uh, um, but we also have a host of upgrades that the owner did to the car. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll take a look at those pipes. Those are the ones that came off the car. Uh, those are just resonators, so they're, they're not catalytic converters. There's no O2 sensors connected to any of this. Um, those pipes uh, were replaced with ones that delete the resonator and it just gives you an extra sound. It has no effect on the ECU. It has no effect on the emissions. It has no effect on the warranty on the car and it's easy to put back if you want it. So that was one, uh, one modification that was done to the car. Um, we also have a sophisticated and almost completely hidden um, uh, radar detector and laser jammer built into the car. And uh, it's only evidenced by a control panel that is all but invisible. And that's that right there. Um, so this was done by uh, Mobile Solutions Calgary. And uh, I've been sending cars to them for over 15 years. And they have basically the market to themselves in Calgary for um, high-end uh, audio and radar installations. They trace the original factory wiring harnesses and really you, you basically can't tell that they've done anything to the car. Um, they've also um, upgraded the sound in this car with a sophisticated uh, digital amplifier, a DSP, and this is layered on top of the Bang & Olufsen system, which is retained, uh, but it is a um, a subwoofer and a DSP controller, and it lives under here. You can see this Helix V12 DSP. That is an addition to the car. Very expensive. It was about seven and a half thousand dollars, and this um, enclosure was built for the subwoofer. Um, and I guess it would have looked similar to the one on this side. We have a Red Star Resonator Delete plus H pipe at a cost of $2,500. And the uh, laser radar detector is a Stinger, uh, and that was $7,500, and another $7,000 for the uh, audio upgrade. Um, we also have these wheels. So these were uh, Vossen, they're 22 inch. This car is running uh, winter tires on the stock rims, uh, and the summer tires are on the aftermarket Vosin, so I want to say Vosin from the French company, Vossen, um, and those were custom painted to match the trim, the window trim, in this matte uh, aluminum, uh, and they were uh, custom finished at great expense. Uh, those wheels were $7,200, okay? So replicating this car in 2024, or their 2024 model year, uh, with all of this equipment, um, with the price increase, would be um, uh, well over uh, $200,000. I didn't mention the wrap. Um, it, uh, the car was built in Daytona, or painted Daytona pearl gray. Uh, the entire car has been uh, matte wrapped. So this looks fantastic on the car for starters, uh, and also protects all of the paint. So I think um, most people would agree this is a really stunning looking wagon. Um, and, uh, you know, reading all the reviews and so on, what, what really comes back from the motoring journalists and their opinions on it is it sort of the ultimate do-everything car. Um, uh, 
uh, you know, it uh, has all the performance you can use and then a lot more than you can use. Um, but it, it also functions as a, a practical daily driver and, uh, you know, something you can take skiing or golfing or drive your kids around. So anyway, fantastic car, great color, uh, nice equipment, good options, and tastefully done aftermarket uh, items that are uh, where the installation has been uh, done to a very high level, very professional installation on it. Do, let's do a walk around uh, of the car. Now this is a, a one owner car. It was bought in Toronto from FAF. It, it lives in BC, but not downtown Vancouver. It lives in central BC and it's been driven on the open road. So the conditions in that where it's been driven, I would say are very favorable. It's not, I mean, the climate's nice. There's no salt on the road, but it's not in gridlock traffic in a major urban center either. So it hasn't gone, you know, it, it, it hasn't been, you know, like stuck in traffic lights its whole life. It's been on the open road. It hasn't been tracked either. So I would say that, that it's pretty much perfect when you consider where the car came from. It's got a clean Carfax. It has no paintwork uh, history. Uh, it's just been to the dealer. So you can't really ask for much more than that on, uh, on a used car. I've got a paint meter here and we can run the uh, paint meter over the car just to verify that, that what's on the Carfax. Um, normal paint is around, uh, normal factory paint uh, on the assembly line is about 200 micrometers. So that is 0.2 of a millimeter. This car has been wrapped and the wrap is also about 0.2 of a millimeter. And so when we go over the car, we expect with some variations, a, a little bit, um, of uh, a readings of around 400 micrometers. So I won't spend too much time on that, but at least we can, we can go through it and just get these readings here. 325, 349, 327, 342, 292, 340, 361, 358, 356, 340, 324, 289, 282, I guess this wrap is a little bit thinner than 200 micrometers, but, and then when the wrap goes on, it gets stretched and so on, so um, there is some variation. 336, 304, 301, 291, 342, 332, 323, 379, 364, 347. Okay, so we've got consistent paint depth, clean Carfax, and that should take any uh, guesswork out of uh, whether the car uh, has original paint or been hit or been in an accident, um, and it hasn't. Okay. So uh, let's look at the front of the car. It is 30,000 kilometers, keeping in mind that it's been completely wrapped. So the paint underneath the wrap is going to be perfect. But in the wrap, um, we can see some evidence of, you know, the odd uh, stone chip. Uh, and the wrap has done what it's supposed to do and protected the paint. So there's just, you know, a little bit of evidence that, uh, 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 you know, it has some pitting. Um, and then on the front spoiler, again, the most vulnerable areas, again, and that is in the wrap and not in the paint. Um, these front spoilers can be, you know, obviously susceptible to damage. And if I, we get the camera down really low here, we can look at the front spoiler, like get it right at the ground. And it looks pretty good. I don't see any evidence that anything has been scraped up on the edge of this spoiler. 
and it's all in good shape. That's actually pretty rare because the car, uh, you know, the, the bumpers are vulnerable. Keep in mind this does have the air suspension so you can raise it to get some clearance. Um, in the windshield, uh, you know, we see again uh, some, you know, that's probably the worst of it there. Uh, it's a chip, but it's not a crack, so we don't expect that to spread. And we've got evidence of some other minor chips in the windshield. Um, oops. That is just a little sap there. Um, we don't see any cracks uh, or chips in the panorama roof. There's a little bit of a mark there on this leading edge. Okay, the side glass and the rear glass is, uh, is uh, fine. Um, the next thing you probably want to look at are the wheels to look for curb rash. And uh, well, we see the very, very minor scuffing there and a couple marks, a couple light marks. Um, now is a good time to look at the brake rotor. Uh, there's a little bit of residual surface rust just from the car being washed but we don't see a big lip in this rotor, and that means that uh, you know, the rotors in the front are not due for replacement for any time soon. Uh, let's look at the rear wheel, and I don't see anything there at all. And uh, there's lots of life left in the rear rotors as well. Um, in terms of Tire life, let's just look at that. Um, might as well look at the rear. And the, we look to have, you know, I'm gonna say about 75% left. Um, I mean, actually it might even be more than that. They look pretty new to me. Uh, so lots of life left on the set of winter tires. And if we look over here on the summer tires, you know, we can see that we have a few 30 seconds, probably three 30 seconds left on the, uh, on the summer tires. And we don't see any uneven wear. And so these are probably good for, you know, at least a season um, before you need to replace them. The winters probably have two or three seasons on them. Okay, so let's continue around and we'll look at the Passenger rear wheel, and I don't see anything on it. It looks perfect. And, and the passenger front wheel as well looks perfect to me. So we've just got one wheel with a few uh, minor imperfections. The rest of the wheels, uh, including the uh, uh, Vossen wheels, look perfect. The next thing we can check is door dings and if we run the camera along the flank here and we look on the sides and we do not see any door dings or scratches or bumper scuffs. Uh, there's no scuff to the edge of the mirrors. I don't see any dents in any of the bodywork at all. Um, no scuffing to the bumper corners. So that's all looks perfectly straight to me. Let's look at the other side. And keeping in mind the matte, the matte finish shows every imperfection and we don't see any, okay? So there's no scuffs in the bumpers, there's no door dings, there's no chips. Um, if we look at the trailing edge of the door, you know, this is susceptible if this door is opened into something, and that all looks perfect, okay? And as well, it's also, again, it's also wrapped. So we do not see any imperfections in any of the sheet metal uh, apart from some minor marks from the front end in the wrap, but not in the paint. Uh, next, we can look at the sills. 
you know, sometimes these areas are vulnerable when people get in the car if they're not that careful. And we can see, um, you know, we have one tiny little mark there. Uh, and then, you know, all this paintwork again, it's wrapped and it's all in perfect shape. The weather seal is in perfect shape. There's no scuffing uh, on, uh, on the sill. Sometimes this panel here, uh, the speaker grill is vulnerable. If people get out, they can kick that and these could be cracked and damaged. And that's not the case here, okay? So, um, you know, there's no evidence of wear uh, from ingress and egress, apart from the tiniest little mark. Uh, and then let's go check the, you know, I don't think anybody's ever been in the passenger compartment in this car, so it looks brand new there. And then, you know, station wagons are used for, you know, obviously all kinds of things, including golf clubs and skis and whatnot. And so we can look at this area here and look for um, any scratches and again it is covered in 3M and uh, there's no marks whatsoever. Also this area uh, has been covered, we can show those rubber mats, uh, covered with rubber mats since new and so we don't see any, um, so it's all in perfect shape. Uh, we've got the load cover and the power trunk closure And uh, we can see as well that the, it doesn't look like anybody's ever gotten in the back. Certainly my kids have never been in the back because we'd all be scuffed up by now if they were. Um, and then the passenger side as well looks perfect. Okay, so uh, overall, with the exterior of the car, it's pretty hard to fall there's some slight pitting in the film in the front end. Uh, there's a you know, couple tiny marks on a wheel and the sill. Otherwise, otherwise the car shows um, as new, basically. Okay. okay, so let's take a look at the interior of the car in more detail. Um, so, the first thing you'd look at, I, I would say, is the bolster wear. Uh, you know, sometimes, especially if the owner's heavier set or not that limber, we can get some wear fairly quickly on the, um, on the front bolster, and we just don't see any here at all or on the side. Um, there's no rips, tears, discoloration, uh, odors, um, anything of note in the interior of the car. There, I mean, sometimes if people have rings and so on, you can see some scratches on the top or the sides of the wheel and are the shifters, we don't see it here. Uh, if the car is left dirty and people put stuff in the center console, you know, we can see, you know, if purses are getting dragged across it or whatever, we can see scratches, but that's not the case here. So everything in the interior looks new. Um, I can't find any fault at all in any of the interior of the car. There's no scratching on the glass or the TFT screens. Um, I think it's all, it's all pretty much perfect, as is the rear compartment, which I actually don't think anybody's ever sat in, or that's the way it looks. And the rear compartment doesn't look like anybody's ever loaded anything in it either. Um, maybe do a slow pan of the interior and just show the interior, the front and rear compartments. And just do, go really slowly through and show all the seats and the dash and so forth.
Okay, we have the RS6 up in the air, and now we can get a close look at the uh, wheel arches and undercarriage of this car. So let's start with the uh, spoiler, and apologies for some of the background noise, it's a working shop here. Um, we, we can see that, that the whole car has a, a wrap, uh, the XPAL wrap on it, and you know, there's a tiny little bit where it's peeling off a little bit, but um, the spoiler itself uh, looks to be in perfect shape. It's actually quite unusual to find uh, an aggressive spoiler like this that has not, that, that doesn't show any damage at all. And uh, those marks are just from the, uh, that's just from the wrap which is peeled over. So um, all this is in, is in perfect shape. I suppose the lowest part is this plastic, this sort of sacrificial bit here. And you can see that it's just a, a tiny little bit uh, chewed up. Well, hardly at all, really. Um, but it's done its job and protected the, uh, protected the, uh, the metal piece. Okay, so we can look again at the front uh, bumper. We see, you know, a lot of times, what, a surprising amount of times you look at these cars and you see broken fasteners, over-tightened fasteners, which then break the plastic under tray, missing fasteners. Uh, you can see, you know, even on late model cars. So we see with this one that, you know, the plastic under trays are in good shape and I don't see that they're cracked. And I see all of the fasteners that are in their correct places, okay? So, the under tray looks good, and we can see the, that's the, again, that's the aftermarket uh, resonator delete uh, pipe um, that, that uh, connects from the down pipes to the rear um, silencer. The cat catalytic converters are up in the center of the V, um, and uh, we can see the uh, under tray, again, that's that kind of felt uh, material but it all looks uh, super clean under here. Um, the other thing we can look for is uh, damage from jacking. Uh, oftentimes, you know, the, the, the cars are designed to be jacked from certain points, uh, but occasionally people put the jack in the wrong spot and break the plastic under trays or dent the metal. So we can look uh, underneath here and uh, we don't see uh, any damage there. It's uh, been jacked up in the correct place. Uh, let's see on that one. And so the sills look good. And nothing out of the ordinary there. So none of these pieces look damaged. And again, all the fasteners appear to be in place, so it's probably never taken apart in the first place, which is why they're still there. Um, and uh, it doesn't look like there's any damage from rocks or any other road debris. Um, and the fasteners are, you know, un they're not corroded, and everything looks pretty good. The rear bumper, again, you can see little bit, little places where the, the protective film is lifting a little bit, which is normal. A uh, little bit of, not sure what's going on with the exhaust pipe, but uh, edge is a little bit discolored. I suppose it's hot. Give you that one as well. Don't see any damage to the rear bumper cover at all, um, or any other damage to the sill. Sometimes when the car is really low, you can uh, you can miss a few things. Um, let's just walk around it slowly. Okay, so all that. All that looks pretty good. No, uh, no flaws worth 
mentioning, and uh, you know the car presents presents itself really nicely underneath uh, with no uh, corrosion. I think which befits its life in British Columbia. If it was driven in Calgary uh, for these years, it would not look like this. Okay, so then let's go and we'll look in the wheel wells. So this is, uh, you know, there's a big air struts. You know, the car has air suspension. It sits on air bellows. There's no coil springs on this car. Although I think it is an option that and adjustable dampers for this car. Um, but this is the higher end setup. This gives you more range between uh, a sporty setup and ride comfort. And we see these enormous uh, 10 piston, uh, one, two, three, four, five on each side, 10 piston calipers. Just look, I, and I think they're from a Lamborghini if I'm not mistaken, but they'd be similar to what's on the big Porsche Cayenne Turbo and Panamera Turbo and uh, uh, the Bentley as well. And uh, again, these like 17 inch plus uh, aluminum and steel rotors. The, uh, the hub unit is aluminum and then the outer portion is steel. They're um, uh, vented uh, radially and axially. Uh, and then they have this space so there's no heat transfer from the steel bit to the hub and the bearings and so on. And there's airspace to cool it. So very, uh, some of the largest steel rotors Think I've ever seen. I can't imagine what they weigh. Um, anyway, we can look at the edge of them, which I guess is the important thing, uh, and see if there is any wear, because uh, then when this edge is is uh, um, uh, gouged, not gouged, but worn, we see a pronounced lip on those, and then it's time for new rotors. So there isn't actually any really real lip on these uh, rotors at all, which means they have most of their life left in them. And, uh, and then you can see lots of life in the pads. So I'm not sure what the, what the wear is on those, but um, there can't be much, uh, there can't be much uh, wear on them. So I'm, I'll call it about 80% on the front. Um, and actually surprisingly, there's a, there's a tiny little lip on the rear um, where there isn't on the front, um, but still it's, it's, I mean, at least 70% on the rear. And you can see the pad there. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so everything looks good in the wheel arch. You can see the air strut. And no accumulated debris, it's all been cleaned out. And, uh, you know, nothing abnormal. And the, the vehicle's probably too new to really see any, you know, cracked bushes or anything like that that I'd normally go through on an older car. It's only, it only has 30,000 kilometers on it. But, um, you know, sometimes also the rotors can pick up, you know, there can be a stone jammed in between the caliper and the rotor and they can get um, radially scratched and so on. So we don't see any of that. And again, no lip on the uh, front rotor. And we'll go to the rear. And just the tiniest of lip on there. I don't know if even the camera can really do that. Okay, so, I mean, there's not too much to show you um, on a car with only 30,000 kilometers, especially a late model car with all of these under trays, because it really doesn't show you too much except for an exhaust pipe um, and some of the suspension. But at least you get an idea, the general um, state of the, of the undercarriage. And uh, I can just do some slow pans so you can get an idea of it. You know, one of the advantages of, of buying cars like this online and particularly on BAT is you get the benefit of this kind of descriptive detail. Whereas, you know, if you just walked in an Audi showroom um, 
and you said that, you know, you wanted to put the car on the hoist and have somebody lie on their back in the middle of the shop and take a slow video <laughs> of the car you wanted to buy. The sales staff and the sales manager would all give you a bunch of strange looks. Um, but this is what you want to see when you buy an expensive car. You want to see if it has damage. You want to see if it's run over anything. You want to see if it's been jacked up correctly. You want to see if the techs haven't been sloppy and not put back all the fasteners or over tightened the fasteners and broke all the plastic under trays. I say this because I look underneath cars every day and I'm amazed at, uh, at, uh, at what I see. So anyway, this really is what you want to see when you buy a car. You want somebody to lie on their back and give you a slow pan of everything that's underneath it. Because this really does tell the story. the RS button here. Sounds like you turned it off when you switch off the RS mode. <laughs> All right, well, let's just, that's good. So to summarize, we've got a really great car here. Um, we've got a rare car. Uh, they haven't made many Audi Sport RSs. Maybe only seven or eight cars in the whole history since the RS2 in the, in the mid 90s. Um, the production is very limited, you know, something around a thousand cars a year. Um, we've got a car that can do everything, 600 horsepower, four wheel drive, a whole host of comfort convenient options. It's a great daily driver, but it, it's also capable of, of tremendous performance. This particular example, uh, you know, was, was treated to driving on the open road. It wasn't stuck in downtown Vancouver traffic its whole life, um, but it was never tracked either. Um, we have a clean Carfax, no accident uh, or paintwork history, and we have the car completely wrapped in a matte finish from new. There is no uh, marks in the paint or exterior damage on any of the panels. The front spoiler is intact. The interior is perfect. Um, we have a few little stone chips, you know, in the, in the matte wrap on the hood and bumper. 
uh, and we've got a few uh, pits out of the front windscreen. And that's basically all that differentiates it from new. Um, we have some tasteful modifications, uh, including um, the uh, change in the resonators, or resonator delete, which gives it a bit of extra sound. Um, we've got a sound system upgrade with a very expensive Helix uh, DSP, and we've got the state-of-the-art uh, Stinger laser radar jammer. So we have some tasteful modifications, two sets of wheels and tires, uh, a car that's, you know, I, I would say impossible to reasonably fault given its age and mileage with no um, material flaws uh, inside or out and full service history at the Audi dealer. Uh, and again, so, you know, no, no paint work on the car. Um, to replace this car uh, would be well over $200,000. And, and that's if you can get one. You know, and any Audi dealer probably only gets one or two of these cars uh, per year. So it's a, great, um, it's a great continuation of the Audi Sport uh, brand. Um, and uh, that, uh, uh, that's really produced some great cars over you know, the last 25 or 30 years. So with that, uh, Lawrence Romanowski from the Lugnuts facility, and that uh, concludes the, the narrated walk-around video on this car, uh, which is for sale in Calgary, Canada.